Bienvenue to CityChampagneJane.com. Good day, I'm Champagne Jane, here with a very special edition of Champagne Jane TV. We're here at Sydney Airport and we're about to collect a very special guest. This young man has come all the way from California. He's a thought leader in the social media and wine world. He was the founder of World Cabernet Day and World Chardonnay Day. He's just spent two weeks travelling around the very best wine regions in Australia, tasting the wines for, for which we're renowned. And at the end of his tour, I've just picked him up from the airport and coming from Perth. I'm just going to give him a little taste of champagne before he goes home. Ladies and gentlemen, please say welcome to Rick Backus. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for having me. I, I love the fact that on this whole tour, you sent me a tweet and you said, hey, you want to come drink some champagne after your trip? And you didn't have to ask me twice. I was definitely going to come. And once you mentioned what we, you were going to open... Um, yeah, I couldn't get here fast enough. Yeah. You kind of say we're both sluts for the bubbles, really, aren't we? Yeah, I'm definitely a slut for champagne, for sure. I just think it's the best thing since sliced bread. It's like champagne's like a holiday in a glass, so as soon as you open a bottle, you know, the smiles come, you feel the, the little bubbles kind of blowing just beneath your nose, just kind mm. of tickling your, your nostrils and get very excited. So we've got, we haven't got a lot of time today, guys, so we're just going to do three champagnes, or I should say two champagnes and one sparkling wine. Mm. We couldn't possibly let Rick leave Australia without trying the very, very best sparkling wine that Australia has to offer. But first and foremost, when you start a champagne tasting, don't you agree you should always go from light to heavy, from white to black? And so we're going to start with a Chardonnay champagne. So this is Pierre Gimenez. Now, this is a grower champagne. So this is a family, two brothers who actually grow their own grapes, make their own wine, and they don't sell their grapes to anybody else. It's um, from the village of Cui, which is the very top of the Côte des Blancs in Champagne. Mm. Family-owned business. They used to be dairy farmers. And they've got um, vineyards in Cui, and they've also got vineyards in Cremont and in Chouilly. Mm. Now, this particular Champagne is their entry-level Champagne, so it's the Cui Premier Cru. Um, but, of course, because it's pure Chardonnay, it's lovely and fruity and quite fresh mm. and tight, and I think this is a really good wine to start on. And what's even more exciting is that here in Australia, this particular champagne, it's exclusively imported by vintage sellers, which is one of the big retailers. And they sell this wine. If you buy a dozen, you can buy it for $40. Hmm, nice. So it's actually cheaper than a lot of sparkling wine. So I think that's a stunning way to start. Let's open it. Absolutely. Let's try it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Let's first it. one. Okay, well, you open that one and I'll open the second one. And then the second one that we're going to try today is the Boulanger. Now the reason I cho chose Boulanger, a couple of fold really. Um, one obviously it's 75% black grape, so it's going to be a completely different type of flavour yeah. profile um, from, from the first champagne. Uh, Boulanger make 2.5 million bottles, these guys make 250,000 bottles. Oh, so wow. we are going very much from boutique to a larger house, although this house is still privately owned, so Bollinger is um, still very much a family business. And this one comes from, uh, the grapes come mainly from the village of Ai. So in the Valle de Marne, and the village of Ai was one of the most famous areas for growing grapes for champagne way back when um, English kings used to uh, make sure they had their own pressoirs in champagne so that when there was war between the English and the French, which was quite frequent, um, they could still be assured of their own wine supply. I love it. Now that we've got these open, I can actually smell those from here. Mm. This is where the happy we get into our happy place. Well, it's kind of a quite floral and lemony and citrusy. But try pouring that one. I'll let you pour. Um, the second one on the side. So Bollinger, so 75% um, black grapes. Obviously, 10% uh, usually of reserve wine, which has been um, vinified in cask as well. So you've got a little oaky components and very rich. I always think of Bollinger kind of like Christmas cake. And I think of this as, as, as wonderfully citrus and almost like lemon sherbet. Mm, love that. And interesting, you might see the shapes are different. Here we've got um, some beautiful flutes. These are all crystal flutes because if you use crystal flutes, of course you get a thinner mm, smells good. neckline here and that, that way more of the wine gets onto the better part of your palate to actually get more of the flavour. Um, but these glasses here, these are all Doton glasses um, designed for Gordon Ramsay, the bad boy uh, celebrity chef. And the second glass that we have here, these are the Regal Prestige Cuvée. Mm. I can smell, that smells yummy. Look at that color. Wow. Check this out. Well, it's great to have you here in Australia, Rick. Yeah, I'm cheers. fabulous. We're drinking champagne. Are these gonna be in your book that's coming out? Uh, yes, indeed. Well, actually, the, the, the Bollinger for sure, because um, one of the sections of the book is all about um, the impact of women in champagne. <laughs> so you're gonna, you're gonna talk about, talk, talk, let's talk about the Gimene first, I'll come back to that. Yeah, this is, <clears throat> this mm. is why we're sluts for bubbles. I mm. love when you get that really, crisp clean 
the acidic backbone and really well made. I mean, that's why champagne is so great. You got that limestone soil, that chalky soil. It's cold. Mm. You just get that fresh, laser sharp crispness. This is stunning. Yeah. Isn't it? Citrusy and fresh. And my God, what great value. Can you believe you can buy that? 40 Australian dollars. I'm not quite sure what that is in, in US. That's kind of like it's 20. It's like 15 cents. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. I might have to carry one there. Well, okay. But mm. I think um, it, 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 it's. It's authentic, it's family owned, it's a grower champagne, it's a family business, and it's really um, the epitome of the Côte Blanc. You know, it's kind of like great structure. It's almost like having um, a fabulous jawline if you want to be a, a movie actor. Mm. I think this is a, a really quite prestigious Chardonnay, and yet the guy that makes it, Didier Jiménez, wants to make the champagne accessible. He wants to have a following around the world. He doesn't want to make it so that people can't afford to drink it. So I think it's a yeah, great I mean, thing to find. Uh, yeah, I mean, a good Blanc de Blanc is really, like you said, it's great. It's a great aperitif. Mm -hmm. And for people who are watching that might not know this, that Blanc de Blanc pretty much means white of whites, or it's yeah. pretty much just Chardonnay. So it's really, it's more crisp. It's not quite as full body, but I just love how it's just really refreshing and starts you off right. Mm, absolutely. It's a, it's a great way to start. I mean, in fact, this is something you could drink at any time. Fabulous for spring and summer. But if you move on from that one, so there you have the small booty grower champagne. Exceptional value. So I don't I don't say that lightly because um, champagne is such a well-made wine that, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to find a bad champagne. But to find a champagne that good, that, that that's mm. accessible price-wise. Just then, if we move now on to the Bollinger, I was saying that mm. um, Bollinger features in the book because, yes, they're, they're a major house, but specifically because of Madame Lily Bollinger. She was one of the famous widows in Champagne that took over the business when her husband died in the middle of the Second World War. And um, she, she led it to greatness. She's um, a, a pretty impressive lady, so there's a whole yeah. story on that. Look at the bubbles on this, how the, the shape of the glass, how it affects the mm. bubbles. See, I think um, tulip glasses like this, I really like that style because it actually gives the bouquet more room to, to breathe and to actually mm -hmm. come out. Um, this class here is the Prestige Cuvée because it's kind of that concentration but on an elongated fashion. Mm. So. I don't know if I can swear on your videos, but this is effing good. <laughs> <laughs> Creamy, you know, mm. roasted almonds, cashews. It's not overly yeasty. No, but, it's, it, but it is quite biscuity. Mm. Um, so I think that, that um, those beautiful flavors, the serendipity of those flavors actually comes mm. because of that little bit of oak integration and obviously from the reserve wines as well. People come to Bollinger, Bollinger doesn't go to people. You know, it's kind of like when you start drinking champagne, you probably start on Moët de Chardonnay, Veuve Clicquot, and um, they're both very well-made champagnes, but they're made to please everybody, so they're kind of crowd pleasers. And I think when you move on to things like Africatien or Bollinger, you're moving much more onto a register of um, richness and complexity, and it takes time to appreciate those things. Yeah, that's beautiful. I mean, you can just tell, when you look at these two together, you can see this one's darker in color, and it feels like that on the palate. It's just a little bit richer, richer texture. Mm. Um, just got this laser sharp precision. Beautiful, more uh, fruity, rounder, fuller. Well, they kind of complement each other. See, I'd have this with my first course. I could imagine that with um, um, a soup. I mm. could definitely see it with um, white bait here in Australia. Um, those little fishies, white bait is quite a popular dish. Um, I could also see that with, with crab or lobster, with this one here, my god, you could you could do anything from a roast chicken, um, even through to duck, I'd say. How about yabbies? Mmm, mmm. Huh? I picked that up. Ah, what other wonderful things have you been eating while you've oh, been here? A lot of bacon. <clears throat> <laughs> well, we know you're a bacon fiend. Yeah. <laughs> so, which one of these would go with bacon, actually? Um, I would say definitely the Bollinger, but you might actually find the third wine that we're going to try here today mm. um, might be the one. So we looked at... So I thought since we could only do three, we looked at a Blanc de Blanc, family grower. We looked at a family business, but obviously a more significant player, more on the register of Pinot Noir. And now if we put those two together, but in a, in a different style, we've got this wine here. Now this wine, this is the latest gorge. So Ed Carr, um, he's been making sparkling wine in, in Australia for over 25 years. He used to be the sparkling winemaker for Seaview. Um, and he moved across to Constellation Wines and he's built the brand Aris. So the first release um, was actually the 1998. Uh, this one here is the 1999. They only made 600 bottles hmm. of this. So this is the second ever Aris to be released in Australia. We're currently on the 2003, which we tried at the YCAT event. Yep. Um, but um, this one is, is, the, is the next release. 600 bottles, we're very lucky to have this one here with us today. 
and this is, with ours usually it's a blend, it's a, a little bit more Chardonnay than Pinot Noir. All the fruit comes from Tasmania. I'm going to go on record and say it. I think one of Australia's biggest secrets is Tasmania and the bubbles that come from mm. there. Outside of maybe Australia and a few wine geeks back home in the States, I don't think people really realize how much good uh, bubbles and sh uh, wine comes out of Tasmania. Absolutely. Um, Tasmania is definitely one of the best local homes of Pinot Noir. And certainly in terms of sparkling wine, as you said, you need sunny days and you need cool evenings. You need a big difference in the diurnal temperature in order to retain the acidity in the grapes. Um, so Tasmania has that in spades. It's absolutely fantastic. And really since the 80s the, is when the sparkling wine industry has taken off in Australia. And, and you know, when um, the flying winemakers like um, Tony Jordan and Brian Crozer were running around looking for the best spots, Tasmania was identified and Aris probably have some of the best vineyards down there. There's also, of course, um, uh, Jantz, which is made by a female winemaker, Natalie mm. Freyer. They produce some beautiful wines and there's a number of other small players as well. But yeah, this one, 600 bottles, about 57% Chardonnay, um, about 40% Pinot Noir, mm. uh, aged on lease for 10 years, mm. pure Tasmanian fruit and very, very mm. limited release. So, well, here's something kind of cool, a little piece of trivia. My wife and I were here in 2008, and we traveled mm. all around, and we went and we chartered a sailboat around Hook Island, the Hamilton mm. Islands. We lived on it for a, a week, and we packed it full of champagne and bubble, or I should say bubbles, Ooh. from Tasmania. Ah. Not champagne. So, yeah, we celebrated our honeymoon with bubbles from Tassie. Beautiful. Mm. And, okay, so why are you Pretty serving it in this glass? Ah, well, this is a good question. Now, yeah. When I was um, last in Champagne, I interviewed Richard Geoffroy, who's the winemaker from Dom Perignon, and um, he's, he's been there now a fair while, and recently um, he's been one of the proponents of different glasses for drinking your Champagne. So the traditional thing was to obviously have a long thin flute, or kind of tulip shape like this, but really if you want to get the impact of, of the, the, the different grapes within the, the aromas that you get in the glass, then you need a larger bowl. So with a um, an aged champagne or with a wine that has a heavy percentage of Pinot, this is really the kind of glass to drink it in. So it's not about then seeing the bubbles, which is more of a visual effect, it's more about concentrating the flavours. Yeah, sometimes, now you said this was aged mm. on leaves for 10 years, yeah. and sometimes you would think when you get a champagne or you get bubbles that sit on leaves that long, they get really yeasty and really mm. a lot of biscuity, but this doesn't have that. This has a lot of finesse. It has that full, rich, round mouthfeel. Yes. But it's not overly... Very um, much obnoxious. So. It's really subtle and elegant. Well, it's kind of like lanolin and there's almost kind hmm. of um, figgy or um, what's the word? The um, I'm thinking not treacle tart, but that kind of viscous caramelly type sauce in there. Mm. Well, this, okay, now this shows why Tazzy really, I mean, the bubbles that come from Tazzy could give champagne a run for its money because mm. you got the same thing that you need cold, 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 cold temperatures, and you got higher elevations. Yes. Right, so it gives you that beautiful high acid that you want. I think of champagne as a joker in the pack. When it comes to pairing wine with food, mm. I think champagne gives you the leeway to match a lot of different dishes because you can have different parts of the flavor register that go with it. Um, the one thing I would say, like with the Blanc de Blanc, don't normally match that with dessert, but I do quite like it with lemon tart. Mm. A nice lemon moussey tart, or even a nice crisp croissant. With a bolly, I think that can pretty much go with anything. Um, it's not quite like Krug. It's not quite the meal in the glass, but it's it's not bad. And this one, this is actually, it's got some peachy flavors to me. It's, it's not sweet, but it's incredibly rich. It's something that's fatty, like scallops. Mm. You could do like apple brown mm. butter scallops. Mm. Um, you could, even you could have this with an apple tart, actually, an apple pie. This, mm. is, this has got the richness and the depth. Mm -hmm. We sort of pigeonhole wine. You know, this whole idea of wine and food pairing is... Mm sort of a misnomer. I don't know if there's necessarily the perfect wine and food pairing. So you might be, people might think, okay, this is going to go with shrimp or something like that. This could go with a number of different things, even some red meat. So like you could do a, like a beef tartare with this one right here mm. with some capers and uh, some olive oil would be kind of mm. fun with some, <clears throat> um, even something that's a little bit more tender, but it's got, uh, what about a rabbit pie? I just kind of get this idea that because it's so rich, yeah, it's such a, such a well-rounded mouthfeel that, that would go really well with, with, with some kind of uh, dark protein, but that had some kind of fluffiness around it as well. I can't say I've had rabbit pie, mm. but if I did, it would probably go with it. Okay. I mean, let's be honest, bubbles go with anything, really. I mean, I would serve this with chicken. Too. Yeah, yeah that's what's great. I mean, this, this one, the first one we looked at, Blanc de Blanc, 
gray as an aperitif. Mm. And then as we move through, it just got a little bit richer and fatter. And you don't have to rule out red wine. I mean, you could do like a charcuterie plate. You could do some, uh, I tried some sake infused prosciutto up in mm. Canada recently, which was kind of fun. And it had this really unique flavor that I think would go really well with uh, the Bollinger. Mm-hmm. So I, I think you can kind of play around with it. And you, know, you could do a polenta with some crab meat in it, which might be kind of fun. Uh, we have Dungeness Crab in the States, which is kind of sweet, but also a little bit salty yeah. and it's kind of delicate. Mm. And that would lend itself nicely to some of these. Beautiful, isn't it? I think yeah. that's the wonderful thing. Champagne really does go with everything and everything goes with champagne. I would love to see anyone who's watching this suggest what they think would go with these and leave it in, mm. in the comments. That's a good idea, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Go to um, champagnejane.com and we'll be posting notes on the champagnes and the sparkling wine that we tried today. It would be lovely to get your comments, actually. So, well, thank you for having me. My absolute pleasure. It's wonderful to see you down there and hopefully we'll see you again. Eat your heart out. (laughs) This is good stuff.